It's remake time once again, and today we are going over the one and only Tauros. A first generation fan favorite, and to this day, the only Pokemon that Ash Ketchum has caught 30 of. Players of the seventh generation games also enjoyed the ride Tauros, a welcome departure from HMs and a cool addition overall. Tauros also had the starring role as Jake LaMotta in Martin Scorsese's 1980 film Raging Bull. Today we'll be examining this bulldozer's effect on the competitive scene, and so we ask how raging was Tauros actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Tauros was the unquestionable king of Gen 1 OU, and to this day remains one of the most dominant Pokemon in any OU metagame. It was the best Pokemon in the metagame and a requirement on each and every serious competitive team, with no exception. It was among RBY's big four, with the other members being Snorlax, Chansey, and Exeggutor. And of those four, it was the least dispensable. Tauros had a ton of amazing qualities. First, it was one of the fastest Pokemon in the tier. This meant that most Pokemon switching into it would have to be able to take two hits from it. This was difficult for a number of reasons. First, thanks to the RBY mechanics, Tauros's high speed also meant it was blessed with a devastating critical hit rate of 21%, making things even more difficult for its switch-ins. Second, the switch-in wouldn't just have to contend with repeated body slams. It would have to take the body slam on the switch and then still be in good enough shape to take the subsequent hyper beam. One couldn't just use faster Pokemon against Tauros either. The only faster Pokemon were Starmie, Alakazam, Jolteon, and the rare Persian. All of them except Starmie were too frail to take its hits, and all of them except Persian were ruined by paralysis from Tauros's body slam. Starmie was a very good check, as it could survive the body slam hyper beam combination, threaten Tauros with thunder wave, and packed recovery, but it certainly wasn't ironclad, as Tauros's crit and para happy body slam could quickly put it into a difficult position. Another reason it was so difficult to switch into Tauros's body slam was because the few Pokemon that actually resisted it were not at all good checks to Tauros. The rock types right on a golem were destroyed by Blizzard. Gengar at least could speed tie Tauros. However, Gengar was also shattered by Earthquake, was rare as a result of its frailty and psychic weakness, and had a tendency to blow itself up on a psychic type, meaning it was rarely ever around to actually check Tauros. As a result, the only Pokemon that could switch into Tauros even somewhat safely were those with immense physical bulk and high health, meaning Snorlax, Exeggutor, Cloyster, and Lapras, in addition to Starmie. However, all of these could be potentially ruined by critical hits, and all but Snorlax did not enjoy body slam paralysis. To make dealing with it even harder, Tauros was no glass cannon either. On the physical side, it easily withstood two ride on earthquakes and was overwhelmingly favored to survive Snorlax's self-destruct, while on the special side, it nearly always survived two Alakazam psychics and Zapdos Thunderbolts. Switching into Tauros was so difficult that it often forced the opponent to sacrifice something before bringing in another Pokemon, just to try and force Tauros out meaning that Tauros was always the best offensive weapon in the game. Keeping one's own Tauros healthy was crucial to avoid being disadvantaged in the late game, but this didn't mean one had to wait until then to use Tauros. It was an excellent early wall breaker, coming in against sleeping Pokemon and firing off risk-free body slams. Teams were so hard pressed to deal with Tauros that often, that Pokemon that would come into the opposing Tauros after a sacrifice would be their own Tauros. Famously referred to as the Tauros War, it was telling of its power that there was often no better option to take on the opposing Tauros than one's own, hoping to win the 50-50 that was two full health Tauroses facing off. This matchup was the single most important in all of RBY. At first, the player who lost the Tauros War would still be likely to paralyze the opposing Tauros, which made it easier to stomach, but once it was discovered that Body Slam couldn't paralyze normal types, the winning Tauros would come out of the exchange para free making the one-on-one -on -one even more important than it was before. As a result, players sought every little statistical advantage they could siphon out of the exchange. The traditional line of play was slam slam beam. However, some players liked throwing Blizzard into the mix, giving themselves the option to freeze the opposing Tauros. The safer line was slam blizzard beam, as that ensured the opposing bull would be in hyper beam range. But some players just went blizzard blizzard beam, as the odds of three hit KOing the opposing Tauros were still quite high, and the extra freeze chance could be game breaking. Blizzard's imperfect accuracy could of course come back to haunt it, but 90% was still quite good. It wasn't hyper beam's accuracy after all 
and it was a viable option. Another option was ditching Earthquake, whose only real use was the rare Gengar, and using Fire Blast instead. Fire Blast had slightly worse accuracy, but in the first generation, it had a 30% burn rate, which was immensely useful. Many players balked at the move, as it could potentially unthaw a frozen Pokemon by accident, but others still recognized its importance in getting the leg up in such an important one-on-one. -on -one. Tauros had other options too, like Thunder or Thunderbolt to lure Cloyster, Stomp to potentially flinch an opposing Pokemon into Hyper Beam range, and Substitute to take advantage of a slower Pokemon switching in as a sacrifice. Out of these, the electric moves were the most consistent, as Cloyster became more and more popular as one of the few things that could semi-reliably take on Tauros's usual sets. It could also crit its way through a boosted Amnesia Slowbro. However, no matter what option Tauros went with, it was still the best Pokemon in RBY OU. Tauros was also excellent in RBY Ubers. It was no longer the best Pokemon around with the mighty Mewtwo and Mew in the picture, but it was still immensely difficult to switch into. It was rarely going to sweep late game, but as an early game wall breaker, it was still excellent. It could play far more aggressively since it didn't need to be preserved as much in OU, allowing it to dent the opposing team even harder and making it easier for its teammates Mew and Mewtwo to clean up. Being an amazing, highly threatening Pokemon in a metagame with those two was a hell of an achievement and capped off an incredible first generation for Tauros. GSC or Gen 2 Tauros is the single most nerfed Pokemon in history. Just about everything in the second generation made it worse, as it was completely destroyed by several key mechanics changes. Most notably, critical hits were no longer based on speed, instead reverting to a universal 6.25%, and Hyper Beam no longer avoided its recharge turn if it KO'd an opposing Pokemon. Those were the biggest ones, but also relevant was how its formerly respectable base 70 special stat split in two and it received an absolutely pathetic base 40 special attack. Spikes seemed like they would help Tauros out, as did the powerful new normal stab move that was returned, but the prominence of Leftovers, the rest and sleep top combination, and new Pokemon like Raikou, Suicune, Mistravis, and Skarmory, in addition to a buff Snorlax, Zapdos, Cloyster, and Exeggutor, meant Tauros was just about never pulling off any meaningful damage. However, it was far too fast and strong for Yu Yu, so it was doomed to languish uselessly in BL. It was never more than a gimmick in OU. Some players tried to make use of the item Berserk Gene on it, as not holding leftovers in exchange for an automatic Swords Dance seemed worthwhile, at least until you remember that it also confused Tauros, making it the epitome of unreliable, and it still couldn't hope to get past Skarmory. Tauros went from being the best in Gen 1 to the worst in Gen 2, as it was even the worst at being the worst, since it wasn't quite bad enough to be allowed in UU. The third generation brought several additions that gave Toro some redemption in OU. It wasn't able to come close to replicating its RBY greatness, but it certainly wasn't a gimmick. Pokemon no longer automatically had maxed out EVs in all stats, so its hit stung a lot more, something Tauros and its base 100 attack appreciated. It also appreciated the addition of Choice Band, which turned its normal stab, both return and double edge, into a nuke against neutral targets. Even with a jolly nature, the latter threatened to two-hit KO the metagame's go-to physical tank, Swampert. It wasn't restricted to running Jolly though. Tauros' speed tier was excellent and it could afford to run adamant for maximum power, making it really tough to withstand its hits, while still outrunning a vast majority of its tier. Its speed provided it opportunities to fire its attacks off if switched in aggressively. Also providing opportunities was its new ability Intimidate, which allowed it to actually switch into a few attacks by softening physical blows and giving Tauros some semblance of defensive utility, being able to help play around Pokemon like Tyranitar and Heracross. Finally, Magneton and its Magneton pool were a reliable method of forcibly removing Skarmory from the game, allowing Tauros to run wild without its biggest counter standing in its way. Now Tauros did have some significant drawbacks. Without the max EV system of the first two generation, its bulk was unimpressive, and it didn't resist much, which A meant it sometimes had difficulty getting on the field, and B meant its defensive utility, while not non-existent, was generally not something that couldn't be replicated and then some by other more well-rounded physical attackers, like Salamence, Gyarados, and Metagross. Plus, once Toros did get on the field, it wasn't guaranteed to slam the opposing team. It was highly prediction reliant between its choice band and the tier's many great normal resistances. Having to choose between threatening with its normal stab or trying to catch a Metagross or Gengar with Earthquake or Hidden Power Ghosts, respectively, wasn't an easy choice, especially when Toros didn't have the defensive capability or longevity to be able to threaten the opposition repeatedly over the course of a game. Not just because of its aforementioned lack of bulk and resistances, but also because it was vulnerable to both spikes and sandstorms. 
Firestorm, meaning it got chipped really quickly, especially when its prediction reliant nature forced it to switch a lot. However, as far as BL Pokemon in OU went, Tauros was quite decent. It was a fast, powerful attacker. It made for some excellent intimidate stacking pairings on physical offense teams alongside Salamence and Gyarados, and there was nothing like outspeeding and decking a Zapdos with Double Edge. The fourth generation brought stronger offensive Pokemon that Tauros couldn't hope to match or compete with. However, this power creep was a blessing in disguise. While Tauros was no longer at all viable in OU, it was now a great fit for UU. Its amazing speed allowed it to blow past nearly every offensive Pokemon, most notably getting the jump on Scyther and Miss Magius, who were already considered very fast. It had to watch out for priority moves and choice scarf users, but that was fine as Tauros's ability to tear through the fire, water, grass core permeating UU made it worth it. Choice Band was still solid but no longer had to be as prediction reliant if it didn't want to be. It made excellent use of the newly added life orb, giving it that all important power boost while still allowing it to switch moves, which in turn made it more difficult to play around. The fourth generation also gave Tauros some great new moves to play with. First, there was Payback, which seemed counterintuitive given Tauros' high speed, but Gen 4 was the one gen where Payback's power also doubled if used on the switch, so it was a great tool for smacking Rotom and Miss Magius, hoping to dissuade Double Edge. Second, it could also use physical pursuit, giving it the option to trap these ghosts, as well as chipping fleeing Mesprit. Finally, Stone Edge provided excellent coverage against threats like Moltres and Altaria, with great power behind it. The presence of physically bulky Pokemon like Rhyperior, Donphan, Registeel, Tangrowth, and Weezing meant Tauros didn't automatically rip through teams. However, with some smart prediction and team support, especially with Spikes chipping each of those walls besides Weezing, it was quite feasible for Tauros to pose a significant threat, breaking a substantial hole in the opponent's defenses for its teammates to take advantage of. Against a offensive teams, it was even more difficult to deal with given their increased frailty, and even had a small bit of defensive utility thanks to Intimidate slowing down threats like Rock Polish Torterra. Speaking of abilities, Gen 4 also gave Tauros Anger Point, but that was never used on account of gimmicky teams. Speaking of never used, that is where Tauros actually wound up. Even though the UU player base all agreed that Tauros was a fine Pokemon in the tier, it wasn't as easy to slap on teams as the metagame staples, and didn't see too much usage as a result, which led to Tauros dropping to Enu. There it became one of the metagame's absolute best Pokemon. Sure, Regirock was quite popular and its massive physical bulk was annoying, but Regirock also didn't have any recovery and was often overwhelmed trying to deal with Charizard. Alternatively, Tauros could wear down Regirock to clear a path for Charizard. Either way, Tauros was fierce. Only the occasional Cradilly could reliably take its hits over the course of the metagame, and its massive speed meant it got plenty of opportunities to fire those hits off, as it outpaced every other offensive threat short of Floatzel and the rare Electro. This meant it got the jump on the next who was already considered very fast, as well as other top tier Pokemon in Charizard, Dodrio, Jinx, Metacham, and Hitmonchan. Other defensive staples like Slowking, Hypno, and Vileplume couldn't stand up to it either, making it effective at cleaving through both the offensive and defensive standards of the metagame. As if all that wasn't enough, Tauros was one of the best ways of removing Haunter, without resorting to Skunk Tank thanks to its powerful pursuit. Overall, Tauros was one of the most dangerous threats in DPP NU. Its unique blend of offense ranking it among the tier's top 5 Pokemon, and as a result, it defined much of the metagame. As a result of Black and White's infamous power creep, Tauros could no longer maintain a UU niche in Gen 5. It returned to NU, which was a lower placement than in the previous generation, thanks to the addition of RU in between the two tiers. However, before we get to its NU performance, we have to examine how it did in RU. It wasn't just a gimmick there, it was tournament-worthy good. Its new Dream World ability, Sheer Force, meant its normal stab, now Rock Climb, was stronger than ever, complete with a lack of life orb recoil. Sheer Force also helped make up for Tauros Tauros' low special attack, allowing it to make use of Fire Blast to roast would-be counters like Tangrowth, Steelix, and Escavalier. With its ever useful speed now backed up with the power boost it needed, Tauros was primed to rip through teams. Once again, it mauled many common offensive and defensive Pokemon such as Durant, who was already considered very fast, as well as Cryogonal, Lilligant, Gallade, Slowking, and Entei. It was also easier than ever to get Tauros on the field to fire its attacks off with the plethora of excellent Vault Switch users it could be paired with, such as Rotomo, Regular Rotom and Magneton. Tauros's one issue was a Loma Mola, who shrugged its attacks off endlessly. However, this was nothing a lure teammate like Toxic Choice Band Dredagon couldn't fix. Overall, Tauros was a genuinely solid Pokemon in Black and White RU, an effective choice for offensive teams that consistently threatened much of the rest of the metagame. Now, just like in the previous generation of UU, Tauros wasn't the easiest Pokemon to fit on a wide variety of RU teams. Thus, it ended up in NU. It wasn't quite as incredible as in the previous generation, but make no mistake, 
it was still an excellent top tier and new Pokemon. It didn't need Fire Blast, so it wound up using Substitute instead. At first, this served to block Misdravis' will o -Wisp, but over time, it took on another purpose. Earthquake proved itself to be superfluous as well, and Lomomola was also in Enu, being infuriatingly unkillable as always. In response, Tauros began running Endeavor, substituting down to low health, and then bringing a Lomomola down with it. A Lomomola could stall Tauros out one-on-one -on -one since Endeavor had only 8 PP, but all Tauros had to do was switch out, then nail a Lomomola with the Endeavor on the switch, which would prevent it from being able to survive Rock Climb afterwards. This forced the opposition into a lose-lose position, as a Lomomola wouldn't be able to switch in, and not much else was able to switch into Tauros safely. Even Golurk and Eviolite Girder got smacked by Sheer Force boosted Zen Headbutts, while Eviolite Tangela and Duotion would succumb to Endeavor as well. Tauros was a mighty wall breaker, making the most of its Charizard and Sock beating speed to rip holes in the opposition, but it wasn't entirely relegated to using Life Orb sets. It was also an excellent Choice Scarfer. Its high speed meant it outran every other Choice Scarfer in the tier, most notably Primate, as well as the few naturally faster Pokemon in the tier in Superior and Swellow, and was even fast enough to outspeed Swift Swim Ludicolo in Rain. As a result, Scarf Tauros was amazing against other offense. It cleaned them up hard, able to easily bypass their speed options, which they would normally use to keep Tauros in check. It had some great options for the last slot too. Pursuit would remove Haunter, letting Tauros help itself by clearing a path for his normal stab late game. Retaliate was a brutally powerful attack that helped even the score after one of Tauros' teammates had been KO'd, and Toxic helped make up for Tauros' lack of wall-breaking potential by crippling Alomomola, Regirock, Tangela, Misdravis, and Golurk. Overall, Tauros was a thoroughly terrific Pokemon in NU once again. Unfortunately, hey, there it is. Tauros wasn't among the Pokemon revitalized by a Mega Evolution in Gen 6. Seriously, can you imagine a Mega Tauros? Because we can, and it's awesome. Sadly, Game Freak did not share our vision, and as such, Tauros dropped to NU once again. There, at least, it was absolutely excellent, ranked by the player base as one of the five best Pokemon in the tier, just as it had been in the fourth generation. As always, its speed, power, and coverage let it pose a massive threat. It outsped the vast majority of the tier, allowing it to threaten offensive teams from prize of staples like Charizard, Jinx, and Magmortar, and was immensely difficult to wall, allowing it to threaten defensive teams. Even checks like Rhydon and Mega Audino could be brought down by the power of a sheer force boosted Iron Tail, though Zen Headbutt was usually preferred to crush Hariyama and Girder. Between the tiers many U-Turners like Zatu, Mesprit, and Scyther, and the Vault Switchers Rotom and Lantern, it was easy to find opportunities for Tauros to blast the opponent. Switching into Tauros was even more difficult given how easily Garbodor and Ferrocene littered the field with spikes, especially with some stab pursuit support from the likes of Skunk Tank or Lipard to remove the Zatu whose magic bounce would block those spikes. It helped that Tauros loved pursuit to begin with, as it helped get rid of Masharna, one of the few Pokemon that could safely tank its hits. Tauros was naturally deadly, but with support it became an absolute monster that consistently dominated most every game it was used in. It also paired well with other powerful normal types like Pyroar and Swellow, working together to overwhelm the opponent's normal resist and clear a path for a late game sweep. Overall, Tauros was ridiculously effective effective, and as a result was one of the most definitive Pokemon in the metagame, making its third consecutive generation of NU excellence. Gen 7's power creep finally sent Tauros below NU, landing in PU, but not for long. It immediately established itself as one of the tier's most terrifying threats. The Life Orb variant was incredibly difficult to switch into, and offensive teams could only really reliably revenge kill with one of two options. The first was a Mach Punch user like Hitmonchan or Girder, which wasn't all that safe since even the rare Bandit Hitmonchan's Mach Punch didn't KO Tauros from full, and Sheer Force prevented the bull from taking Life Orb recoil. The second was a Choice Scarfer, whose Choice Lock was exploitable, and the best Scarfer was also Tauros. It was a tremendous late game cleaner and kept many dangerous sweepers like Shell Smash, Barbara Cole, Quiver Dance, Lilligan, and Z Celebrate Charizard in check. Tauros was far too good and was banned alongside Vanillix in the PU metagame's early stages. Tauros's ban was bittersweet. On one hand, being too good for a tier is cool, but on the other, its only hope for users was to try and eke out a niche in Anu, and it didn't succeed in that endeavor. The metagame was incredibly hostile to it, threatening it from every corner. Between Intimidate Incineroar, Scarf Passimian, and not being able to fit all of Workup, Zen Headbutt, and Iron Tail, and thus losing to many other metagame stables like Rhydon, Vaporeon, Weezing, and Aerodactyl. There were just too many problems for Tauros to ever be effective with any semblance of consistency. Tauros really wasn't worth using, and thus languished in PUBL, not to be seen for the rest of the 7th generation. However, it had finally dominated a tier to the point of being banned almost instantly, which is pretty awesome.
Generation 8 has added some amazing moves to Tauros's repertoire. The brutally powerful fighting coverage of close combat and the improved dark coverage of the sheer force boosted throat chop. Both moves made Tauros even more of an offensive menace, and it was banned from NU during the Isle of Armor. With Crown Tundra's release, it's been unbanned and now roams NU again. But before we explore Tauros's lore in NU once more, we'll examine how it performed in the Isle of Armor RU metagame after it was banned from NU. Tauros had to use Body Slam as its normal stab, as Generation 8 removed Rock Climb, but it was still plenty strong, especially considering how many opportunities it had to barrage the opponent with its attacks thanks to its excellent speed, allowing it to outrun and destroy already fast Pokemon like Virizion, and how many Pokemon it could now hit super effectively thanks to its new moves. Previously, the presence of Bronzong would have been a death sentence, but with Throat Chop, it was simply another Pokemon Tauros could rip through easily, as were Golarian Slowbro and Golurk. While close combat absolutely pummeled Rhyperior, Gigalith, and Steelix, Tauros also loved all the Swish moves in the metagame, as the additions of Teleport and Flip Turn made it easier to get it on the field, and Clef Key's reliable spikes made it even more difficult to switch into. So Tauros was quite a solid Pokemon in the Isle of Armor RU metagame. Now to NU. It is so ferocious with the additions of Close Combat and Throat Chop that it's been banned twice already. It was first banned during the initial NU metagame, then it was re-released upon the release of Isle of Armor, and was re-banned almost instantly. With its blend of power, speed, and coverage, it was downright impossible to switch into without Sableye. It's been released again, but it's still on the ban radar of many players. Not much has changed, and Regirock is no longer a good check given how much it takes from close combat. It wouldn't be at all surprising to see Tauros pull off the hat trick and get banned from RU a third time, and it's not unlikely it maintains a solid or at least decent niche in RU. And that's it, so how raging was Tauros actually? Well, it started out as the undisputed best Pokemon in the first generation of OU, and was even excellent in Ubers. Then the critical hit and Hyper Beam mechanics that made it so good were changed, and it was never the same again. It was decent in OU again in Gen 3, but nothing spectacular, and after that it was relegated to a lifetime of NU, with occasional UU and RU appearances, as well as being banned from PU once. However, it wasn't all bad. It was one of the most iconic NU Pokemon Pokemon of all time, having maintained high level status in the tier for three generations straight. It did fall off in Gen 7, but came roaring back in Gen 8 with some nice new moves. I know we've been saying this a lot, but see how little it takes Game Freak. As a result, it's been banned from NU twice already. The expanded Crown Tundra metagame might make it more palatable, but it also might not be enough. Tauros with close combat and throat chop is seriously terrifying, and could very well get banned from NU a third time before resuming its attack on RU. However, no matter what ends up happening, as far as we're concerned, this generation is already a win for Tauros. However, wherever it ends up, it's likely to pose a massive threat. Tauros has a unique place in Pokemon history. It's certainly seen its lows, but it's also had some of the highest highs. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you'd like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Tauros? What would you do to improve Tauros to make it go up past NU? Would you give its critical hits or hyper beam mechanics back? Also, thank you so much to our patience for continued support of our videos and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.